so uh, Parsec. So Parsec, I'm for, well, I'm Chris Dixon. I'm the, uh, one of the founder, co-founder and CTO of Parsec. Um, what Parsec lets you do is basically play video games if you don't have gaming hardware. So, you know, if you used to play video games when you were in college or something, or when you were a kid, and now all you have is a MacBook Pro that can't really play the best games in the world, or you're playing them and you're limping in with like 20 frames per second or something like that, uh, Parsec allows you to stream the game in real time with low latency from a cloud machine somewhere. Or it really has two use cases now. It allows you to stream either from like Amazon that has GPU instances, or like actually all the cloud providers have now. Azure has it uh, and Google. Or if you have your own gaming PC, you can actually stream from your own gaming PC remotely. So you can think of it in that sense, almost like remote desktop on steroids, kind of. Uh, it's like remote desktop, but stricter requirements and tuned especially for gaming. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's a high performance video streamer. And there are a lot of different components to this. This is taken off of our website here. Um, and I mean, I was thinking about what to talk about because there are a lot of little different things that I thought maybe you guys would find interesting. Uh, but I think the most general purpose, and, and one of the things I've done a lot of work on, is actually our networking. The networking is like a really critical component to all this. Because, uh, you know, you're streaming like a zero buffered, low latency video stream at like 10 megabits per second or higher. And any little hiccup, any loss, any, anything really kind of throws the thing for a loop. So the networking's got to be really good. Um, so I'm going to talk about today uh, kind of how you would go about uh, and this is, you can think of this almost like our implementation has a little more bells and whistles on top of what I'm going to describe, but I'm almost going to present like kind of the naive implementation or like the, the basic implementation of kind of rolling your own like reliable like UDP protocol. So I'll kind of, I don't know if, you know, a little low level maybe, but hopefully you guys find it interesting and you can apply it in your own work if you find yourself in a situation like the one we're in here. Uh, Oh, and uh, yeah, a little, little color here. If you're wondering where the name came from, and there's no sound. Should I have known that it's a ship that made a Tesla like this? 12 parsecs. Did you hear that? No. <laughs> 12 parsecs from the Castle Run. So that really embodies what we're trying to be as a company, right there. Uh, okay, so. First implementation, we started out with TCP, um, as anyone would. It works right out of the box. Uh, you don't have to worry about loss, it's good. Uh, but I want to show you um, what happens in, in a scenario like, like Parsec, the way it streams, what happens when you use TCP and you apply a little bit of loss to the situation. So this is a video we recorded that, uh, it's kind of self-explanatory actually. Okay, so here's me in the practice range of Overwatch on TCP, good connection, very good. So I'm streaming from an Amazon server now to my computer in my office. I'm going from New York to Virginia here playing Overwatch. Here's 5% packet loss. So I'm using Clumsy, that's the Windows tool to simulate it. And it just kind of, it just kind of blows up. Like I can't move, I'm like lagged, it's doing its congestion control, it's just like, throwing me for a loop, it's, it's basically unplayable. So that's what happens when you experience packet loss uh, or, or some sort of congestion event when you try and use TCP for this type of streaming. Um, and this is the situation that we were trying to avoid. So that caused us to look deeper and after evaluating some of the out of the box solutions that we found, some RTSP stuff, we looked at like Google's Quick, uh, we looked at a handful of other sort of reliable UDP things I still felt we needed more control, and so I went for it. All right, so that's what follows. Uh, so I don't want to like do like networking 101 here because this is stuff a lot of you probably already know. But TCP versus UDP, they seem like they're really similar because they often appear like in the same drop-down menu, like for stuff. It's like, what would you like to allow? TCP, UDP, both. So it seems like they belong on the same level, but nothing could be further from the truth. TCP is like intensely complicated and extremely wrapped. Uh, and you probably know this, it handles congestion control. This is over here. It handles, uh, so like beneath, uh, beneath the, the surface, the, the, you know, the internet deals in packets, which are like little messages that can, can 
disappear or make it, maybe. Uh, and TCP handles all of that sort of retransmission and reliability under the hood. It turns, it basically turns a network stream of packets, which is a really intensely unreliable thing, into like reading from a file. So, which is what you want. Like, yet you like to deal with that. You like to be able to just read like you're reading from a file or from some reliable source. And TCP handles all that for you. UDP does none of that. It's essentially like a really thin abstraction over an IP packet. Adds a little bit of a header. Uh, and that's it. You send packets out, almost like raw packets over the network. Sometimes they get there, sometimes they don't. Uh, and I added this little stat from the Linux kernel um, just to show you how complex TCP is versus UDP. Uh, TCP is 32 files in the repo, 724 kilobytes of code, UDP 6 files, 95 kilobytes. So it's like seven times the code for the TCP stack. Um, so yeah, uh, moving on here. So some of TCP we wanted to keep in our implementation, like the reliability and the reordering is good. The stream-oriented nature of it is good. We wanted to deal with data like that. Uh, like the, connect, the way you make the connections, the handshaking, like connecting like that, that's good. Uh, where, we, where it really breaks down in our case is the congestion control. So we deal with lossy compression. We use H.264 uh, to do all this encode super fast given some of the hardware support that we have. Um, but yeah, we, so we, we, can, we can tune the encoder to send a certain bit rate. So we don't, we can tell the encoder, like if we can detect the congestion, we can tell the encoder, I don't want you to send 10 megabits per second. I want you to send five, or I want, I could, you can tweak it on the fly. So we could really handle the congestion ourselves. We didn't need TCP to do that for us. So TCP was sort of gumming up the works in that sense over what we could do on our own. Uh, and also, one thing you can do, um, that, so TCP is like the workhorse of the internet. It's used for everything. It's meant to work everywhere. It's meant to like, it prioritizes like the data getting there over everything else. So it works on like your most resource constricted device. It works like in space. It works like everywhere. So we don't need that because we have actually a pretty narrow range of, of acceptable sort of internet specs that Parsec can run on. I mean, if you have over 100 milliseconds of network latency, you might as well not even use it because it's going to suck. Uh, if you have like, um, right, if you have like less than one megabit of bandwidth, you might as well not even use it, right? TCP needs to work under all those conditions. So we can narrow the use case and, and sort of code the thing specially for what we're doing. Uh, now, hole punching, I have to talk about this for a second because this is one of the coolest things I think I've ever discovered in my life not just in technology, but this is like the original like bug that became a feature. Uh, and this is sort of like a UDP only feature where like you, since UDP is stateless, you, you can send it, when you send out a UDP packet and you're behind a firewall or a NAT, uh, I mean, the NAT assumes that you might want to receive one back from wherever you're sending it to. So it actually creates a little mapping there for you to receive data back from wherever you just sent that packet to. That can be kind of, misappropriated, if you will, to sort of, if you have a third party that can gather information from two peers that want to connect to one another, you can actually use that system to create a peer-to-peer -peer connection with these little, that's what's called hole punching, with these little open windows that you can create with UDP. The, the NAT holds more state with TCP, which makes it a hell of a lot harder to do. Um, and point of interest, Amazon security groups, actually you can hole punch through those. So we can actually connect to Amazon servers that have no ports open, that are literally closed to the world uh, with hole punching. So security groups, not as secure as you thought. Um, so yeah, I talked about a little bit of this. Uh, you also get detailed metrics. So like you know what your loss is, you know what your round trip time is. Believe it or not, that can be difficult to get when you're using TCP. Like Linux has some like non-standard API to get it, but Good luck trying to get that information on Windows or something, some of the machines that our, our thing needs to run on. Um, you have just tight control over everything. Everything's in user space. Nothing is left to the kernel. Uh, and the best part about it is you can choose what to drop and what not to drop. A good example of this is absolute uh, cursor data. So we send cursor data over to control stuff on the remote machine. Every packet that goes over is an absolute coordinate of where the cursor should go. Um, if you miss one of those, it's okay, because the next one that comes tells you where the cursor should be anyway. So in that case, we can shut all of that off and say, all right, drop it. And you can do that on a finer-grained level in some of the more advanced work we do with H.264, 
which is like maybe you accept the header reliably and maybe you allow packet loss in the, in the payload. And maybe you patch up that loss by telling the encoder to do something a little different. And so it's great to have that control when you want to make a really high performance solution. Uh, okay, so in the interest of time here, let's move this along. Uh, so I'm gonna go through some of the concepts here real quick as to like how you would go about thinking about implementing something like this if you really wanted to, to do it, uh, if, you're, if you're brave enough to try and do this. Um, so ours is all written in C. Uh, I, I guess you could probably write it in something else, but um, I don't know. I wouldn't advise it. Uh, I'm sure it were, I, I maybe like, maybe you could do it like in Go or something like that. Um, Wireshark, if you don't already have that installed, you should install it, because it's like the best, I wrote it even there, the best program, it's my favorite program. Uh, you'd be shocked if you just leave that thing open, like what you'll see. Like, like Wireshark. Wireshark is a packet, like a deep packet analyzer, and it measures every uh, packet coming in and out of your machine. And it, I think it actually can like, no, yeah, everything that hits your interface you can see, and it parses it, and you can look at the, the binary, and you can just do everything. It, like, and it, you know, it decrypts sort of the SSL data. You can look at it. It's really good. It's really, really good. And for something like this, when you have to debug it, it's essential. Um, and then, of course, you need something that can test the loss. Like it's clumsy for Windows, network conditioner, Xcode thing on Mac, and TC, the reliable TC on Linux. Uh, so if you're making something like this, and it's your own protocol, you need to put some kind of header there. We're gonna keep it super simple at first and just include in the header a sequence number. And this is a concept from TCP. Um, again, this is like the reference implementation. This isn't like the bells and whistles implementation. But you need like a sequence number to tell you in your stream where that packet belongs. And of course you need something to identify the type. Like what type of packet is it? Is it an ACK? Is it a piece of data? Is it to keep alive? You just need some flag there to describe that. Then you have your payload, that's not really part of the header, but you have your payload. Um, so now I'm gonna talk about the concept of windows, like read, write windows, and TCP also has this concept. So these are like the shared data structures that uh, the data is read into and written into and sent out from. This is what keeps track of the state of the connection. So like when things are coming in, where they go and, you know, how they're organized. And I, I think I should just go on to this next thing to kind of give you the sense of what this might look like. Forgive me if this is a little deep, but you know, I'm trying to, uh, I want you guys to learn something. <laughs> um, if you don't already know it. But uh, so the top thing here is the, is the write window. This is what a write window might look like when you're sending packets. Um, and the write window has three different states. So you've got like, you can think of like an array or like a slots in your sequence and in the right window, you've got kind of your sent but unact packets at the base there. You've got kind of your, right, your written but unsent packets here in green, and then you've got your head. So this is the, the area of the window that hasn't been touched yet. And so the base is over here, and this thing's waiting for an ack. It's not gonna overwrite this, or it's not gonna move any further. It's gonna keep checking this until it gets an ack. And we'll move on to that when I get into retransmission. But the base here, I mean, this is the read window. This, is a, this only has two states, as opposed to the, the write window. But you, you basically, you're at the base here. This is what's yet to have been read from the application. So if you're in your application and you're reading, this is the next spot it's gonna start popping off data from the window. And you've got your head, this is where it's gonna be writing to. So it's sort of like, and, and this is a concurrency thing, you'll see in a second, but this is where you'd write, this is where the data's getting attached to the end of this queue here. Basically just a queue, it's like a circular buffer, like a ring buffer. Uh, an ACK, just like an ACK in TCP, every time you get something, you have to send back an acknowledgement to say, I've gotten this, uh, and I don't need to retransmit it, or you know, forget about it now, keep going, you know, advance the sequence number. Uh, this is also how you calculate the round trip time. So you send, you get an ACK, you know what your latency is, you know what your round trip time is. Keep alives. You have to have something like this because otherwise you don't really have a concept of a state, like a connection state. You need something that keeps the, the connection alive um, and doesn't make it time out essentially. So these are like dummy packets almost saying, don't close on me. 
So retransmissions, uh, this is where like most of the headache is if you ever wanted to try and implement something like this. Uh, retransmissions, so this means I've sent something and I haven't gotten an acknowledgement in a certain amount of time or something looks funny in the way I'm getting the acknowledgements. I'm just gonna go to the picture here so you kind of see uh, how, how we think about handling it. Um, so this is the right window here. And in red, these are the sent but unact packets, and the blue is empty. And so we do something called a fast retransmit, where you don't actually, you keep sending, and you don't, you, you, you don't wait, you don't do a round trip on every send and wait for an act. You just keep going. You just keep sending. And you, you asynchronously wait for the acts. Now, out-of-order packets, which you've heard of, uh, like, on the internet, it usually happens over Wi-Fi, but they're usually flipped. So it's not like drastically out of order. It's not like you get a packet that's like, like 10 elements out of order. It's usually just one element out of order. And so if we get this act, but we didn't get this act, well, that's kind of suspicious because we sent this first, but we got this act back first. So something looks like it might be wrong, but we're not gonna do anything yet because we're gonna wait for a second just in case these packets, these acts are flipped. So we won't send a retransmit here, but in this case we would. So we've got an ack, 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 and then this is sent, but no ack, and then we've got two acks after it. In this case, we would send a fast retransmit um, because this means, okay, this is probably dropped right here. The, the receiving end probably didn't get this. Uh, and so we only do like a handful of these or even just one of them before we stop and then move to a slow retransmit because you can really fill up the pipe this way if you're not careful. But in a high performance solution, this is critical because you can't wait for round trips to resend packets in a system like this. You have to just like take action immediately. Uh, so like, I'm gonna talk, this isn't like a, a thing on concurrency, but I'm gonna just touch on it briefly. So like, in a system like this, there has to be concurrency really if you're gonna provide like a decent interface to your application because I mean, think, you can't be like, you can't have your application be sending keep alives. Like, that's not something you'd ever want to deal with. You need threads in the background that are handling that. And unfortunately, with concurrency comes a whole slew of other problems, which is what can make this really difficult. Um, and the thing I've learned, if you ever find yourself working on something like this, is when it comes to concurrency, start with the dumb synchronization first. Like, use like some global mutex or lock that locks everything and start there, right? And then make sure your application logic, make sure your implementation is good. And then work on like fine tuning the, you know, like the, the locking and getting everything like super parallelized. Because I've made the mistake of trying to go too deep too early in, in the synchronization and you're dealing with two things at once at that point. So, you know, just a little, a little my little two cents on, uh, on concurrency. Um, I mean, because most of the time these threads are sleeping. Like most of the time these, this isn't like a, the type of thing where you need to squeeze every ounce out of the CPU. They're mostly sleeping waiting for messages. So it's actually okay to kind of be dumb with the mutexes. Uh, I'm gonna skip this for now. This is a little bit more on our, how we do congestion. We do, we use kind of like a cubic um, function to kind of feed to the encoder. So this isn't like strictly part of the protocol but we kind of use, uh, that's what kind of our, our, our start, sort of our slow start looks like, and if we reach a congestion event, that's kind of how it scales down, but there's not too much to, to go into. I don't really want to go into that too much right now. Um, and then of course, at the end of the day, same scenario. Oh, by the way, I named our protocol BUD. Uh, I had to give it a name, and I, I chose BUD. It stands for Better User Datagrams. It's a little pompous, actually, but whatever, you know. And so this is the same scenario, really. Um, and so here's our protocol with 0% uh, or 0 packet loss, just same, same connection in the office here. All headshots. <laughs> and then same scenario as before. And yeah, turning on the 5% loss. And it just keeps running smoothly. So this is what you can squeeze out if you take control over the scenario and kind of implement your own logic. So it, it's hard to pick up on this video. It is a little more jittery than before. 5% packet loss is like, 
This thing holds up under much higher, but it's not common to get solid 5% packet loss. Usually you back off a little bit and the packet loss goes away. But this is just an example to show you that the protocol holds up much better when you're in sort of a congestion sort of scenario. And my CEO put this slide in. <laughs> so that's it. Yeah. Awesome, thank you. Well, they have it a lot easier because they have buffers. So like we have no buffers at all. I mean, everything is shipped over the network and, and decoded and rendered as fast as humanly possible. And so like most of the work we've done has been around like just making, like getting it to be smooth under that kind of, because a buffer is what you want. That makes it smooth and you can time things really well. And it's easier, it's much easier to do congestion control because you can just take a look at your buffer and if things are like moving around, you're like, uh-oh, stop sending so fast or send faster. Uh, but when you have no buffer, you need to make like decisions like instantaneously. Right. Yeah. What's your favorite game? Of all time? Uh, at the moment? Well, all I do is work now, so. <laughs> um, I don't know, I like, uh, I like Overwatch. I mean, I'm not like an avid player though. I, I shouldn't say that. I, I mean, someone's going to ask me some Overwatch question. I'm like, oh. um, I don't know. I don't play as much anymore. Sometimes I admit it, though. Sometimes I pop into WoW still a little bit. Yeah, judge me. But, uh, you know, when I, uh, it's, a, it's an old school game that, you know, I was addicted to as a kid. So sometimes the urges come back and I'll, I'll spend a weekend doing that. But, you know. So what tools do you use to test uh, the protocol? Uh, I mean, like, do you have some scenarios to test uh, how it works over the network? Uh, we have some unit tests that one of, I mean, I personally, my acid test is just like cranking up the loss a ton and seeing if it holds together. Uh, not very scientific, but usually it flushes out bugs pretty quickly if I make a change to it. Uh, we also have some scripts that kind of run it through the ringer uh, that kind of like send data in strange ways with like, you know, uh, different packet loss and dropping scenarios that kind of make sure that everything looks right. Um, usually if you've got a race condition in something like this, it comes out pretty quickly. Like you, you know, it, it, it just does. Like if you just start sending it bad data, like if it's not rock solid and you, and you start throwing a ton of loss at it with sort of garbage data, you're gonna crash something very fast. So uh, it's kind of. Okay, <laughs> thank you. How does this uh, hold up like globally in, in areas where maybe connection isn't as strong or this, the lines of communication are longer? It actually holds up pretty well. Um, I would actually use it on the plane. I, I, went to, uh, I went to LA recently and I connected to my home machine. I use Parsec as like a remote desktop tool as well. Um, and I used Parsec from the plane using this protocol and it worked, it worked well. It's a bit wasteful in that scenario. It, I have a feeling certain networking environments might, might throttle it a little bit more because it, it tends to retransmit pretty aggressively, but it held up fine on the plane with whatever internet, the satellite internet they were using. The latency was terrible, but you know, it, it held together, which I was impressed at, so. I need to test it from space, but I, I don't have, I don't know how much that costs, but I'm pretty far away from being able to afford it, whatever it is. All right. You can just shout it. Yeah. Not the only time I, I glossed over that in the presentation. We have sort of a fail-safe, slow retransmit uh, system as well. So, like, it, it especially happens when you send like just one packet of data. And then maybe that's all that one of the, the ends sends. If you drop that, then your fast retransmit won't work because there's no next act to like look back and say, oh, we missed one. So you need sort of a fail safe. It, it's like a, uh, it's based off the round trip time. It's a multiple of the round trip time. And if you haven't seen the thing get act in some like, you know, 
a second, let's call it, or 500 milliseconds or something, you'll just send the, you'll send the retransmit anyway. Right. Well, so, okay, and I glossed over that a little bit too. But there was in in when the acts are sent, um, they're sort of redundant acts. So the reading end is always updating the writing end as to where it's at in the stream. So like if there's some loss there, and maybe there's some in the pipeline, some act doesn't make it. If the receiving end actually did get that packet and it moved on in the stream, it'll update the sender to say I've moved past that. So don't stop, don't even try, and like, you're done. Don't, don't start, keep calculating and retransmitting. Um, so that's kind of that's how we handle that. I, I generally try and use close to 1,500, um, as close to that as I can. I mean, my thought is that the larger, the, is, if you go over that, you're screwed. Uh, but, because it just starts, you know, that's just the standard packet size. But uh, I don't know. It seems to me that processing more packets, especially since we're doing reli when we're in reliable mode, processing more packets, more overhead. I'd rather fit more in one packet. That's my. I haven't tested that a lot actually, but I just make it as big as. I, I think our packet size is like 14 something, 1450-ish. With we also use DTLS, which is the uh, the, the UDP sort of TLS, um, and. Uh, that adds like another 50 bytes or something to the head. So it's like 1450 at the end of the day. It's like how big our packets are usually when they're full. You know, the, the mouse cursor stuff's a lot smaller. Cool. Chris, thank you very yep. much.